Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. I work for a small newspaper in the Midwest. My boss had been kind enough to give me Friday afternoon off after a string of late nights. Excited to finally get some rest, I ran a few errands before heading home. As I pulled into the driveway, I noticed something odd. There were two cars parked there. One was my wife Tracy's, but the other was unfamiliar. Tracy usually worked until 5 p.m., so seeing her car home midday was unusual. Despite the strange sight, I trusted Tracy completely and didn't immediately assume the worst. Unlocking the front door, I stepped inside, hoping for a peaceful nap. However, what I heard shattered that hope. From upstairs, unmistakable sounds of intimacy echoed through the house. My heart sank as I realized what was happening in our bedroom. The door was obviously open, because they obviously weren't expecting company, and I could hear moaning and yelling. I took the carpeted stairs two at a time, and when I got near the bedroom I could hear them much more clearly. This what you want. This what that your husband not giving you. Railed some guy I had never heard before to my wife, who was groaning louder as she was obviously getting pounded. When I got to the door of my bedroom, I could see my gorgeous wife on her back beneath some guy who looked like he played linebacker for the Packers giving her a tremendous sex. And from what little I could see, he was giving a lot to her. Despite what he had said, Tracy had never indicated to me previously that she felt unfilled. But what I was seeing and hearing told me I wasn't measuring up for her. I was suddenly feeling extremely nauseous, probably because my world was crumbling right in front of my eyes. Playing thrill. Don't mind me. I finally yelled as I walked into the room, opened my closet door, took out my gym bag, and started putting a couple of changes of clothes in it. Derek barely broke stride until Tracy realized I was there and stopped screwing him. Oh, shit. Simon, I'm so sorry you had to see this. She yelled from underneath the monster. We were going to tell you. Not of you find out like this. I confronted Tracy, my emotions running high. Is this when you chose to do this, Trace? On our 10th anniversary. I couldn't ignore the evidence. This wasn't a one-time thing. Tracy avoided eye contact. Her silence speaking volumes. Forget it, Tracy, I said, my voice heavy with disappointment. I'll gather my things and leave you to it. My lawyer will handle the rest. By the way, who the hell is this Neanderthal plugging you? That's kind of funny, she giggled. Derek is my attorney. He works for one of the big firms downtown. Perfect, I said. I didn't bother to even close the front door when I left the house. I put my stuff in my Ford F-150 and headed straight for my favorite watering hole. Not exactly an auspicious start to the weekend. Most bars are pretty empty on a weekday afternoon and the rusty fork was no exception. Even my favorite bartender, Noel, didn't begin his shift until 4. As I sat there, a wave of realization washed over me. Maybe I should have seen this coming. The signs were there, like when we went to one of Tracy's work events, and her colleagues showed thinly veiled contempt toward me. I sensed Tracy starting to agree with their opinions about my job and ability to provide for her desired lifestyle. She didn't hesitate to mention her higher salary, and we had a tense conversation about her behavior that night. She blamed it on being tipsy, but I wasn't fully convinced. Still, I didn't hold on to the resentment, and we seemed okay a few days later. Or so I thought. Now, as I sat at the bar, I knew I should be securing my finances, but I couldn't muster the energy to care. My credit card is in my name only, which means I can spend the rest of the night getting shitfaced before sleeping it off in my truck. I'll find a hotel or an apartment to rent tomorrow. Tracy and I met at a major Midwestern university. We dated for our junior and senior years before I asked her to marry me. We knew that unless I could get on at a major newspaper in a major city, she was probably always going to out-earn me. But we both agreed that everything we made was ours, not that there would be a hers and mine. And that's what I thought we had until recently. I don't know how much of her attitude is because of her co-workers, but apparently she has lost her respect for me completely, and as for her love. Well, today showed me exactly where I stood. Noel greeted me when he came on at 4 and was mildly surprised at how early I was there. I gave him the Reader's Digest version of my earlier afternoon and handed him my pickup keys with instructions to pour me into the vehicle's cab when I was done, but not to give me my keys back until I woke up tomorrow. That's harsh, dude. Finding out that way, he said to me while we talked. At about 9 p.m., I wasn't feeling any pain, let alone my extremities, when a state trooper showed up in the bar. He ambled over to Noel behind the bar and asked him if a Mr. Simon Tillerson was on the premises. Noel, of course, pointed over at me. The trooper then ambled over to me. He was very good at this ambling thing. I thought in my fogged brain and said he had some news he regretted he had to tell me. My wife and a Mr. Derek Biggs were killed on the road about three hours ago when a semi blew a light in town and drove over the top of Mr. Biggs' BMW convertible. 
Authorities had been trying to find me for three hours before one of my acquaintances told them about my favorite bar. Screw me. I yelled. Drinks are on me. There is a god in heaven. A cheer went up for my announcement. Trooper Reginald Masters looked like he'd seen a ghost. I don't think he was expecting glee from the new widower. Mr. Tillerson, I get that you must be in shock, but... Not shock, buddy. Ecstasy. I wailed in my drunken state. The reason I'm so screwed up is because I caught the two of them screwing in my bed this afternoon. I was going to leave the witch. Screw her dead body. This couldn't get any better. The trooper still looked appalled. I couldn't care less. Normally we like for the next of kin to identify the body, just to be completely sure it truly is that person who is dead. But I don't think Mr. Tillerson is going to be of any help tonight, Master said to Noel. Could you make sure that someone leaves him the message to go over to the moor tomorrow? Noel nodded affirmatively. In my drunken state, I understood what Masters had told me. Even though I knew I'd miss my wife when I sobered up, I was angry because she cheated on me and was planning to replace me. So, my anger at Tracy outweighed any love I still had for her. The next morning, I woke up in the cab of my pickup feeling stiff and sore. Despite considering staying at a hotel, I remembered what the trooper had said and went home to my empty house instead. I thought about the nine years we spent together, especially the last seven as a married couple. It made me sad that things had ended this way. I wasn't exactly grieving, but I couldn't help feeling some satisfaction that Tracy got what I thought she deserved. After cleaning up at home, I went to the morgue to identify Tracy's body, which looked battered. I guess having a semi go over the top of you in a convertible will do that. I asked to see the other body as well. Derek looked similar to Tracy. I hoped at least in his case death was slower to come. When I got back home, I knew I had to make at least three phone calls, one to my parents, one to her parents, and one to her sister, Anya. I knew somewhere deep down inside I was sorry to see her die, but at that moment every thought of her came with the visual of her urging her paramour to give it to her, and I really couldn't muster any sorrow in my heart for her. So I decided I would do my job, report the facts, and keep my lack of emotion out of the equation if I could. At least I did feel bad for Ron and Cindy Jacobs, Tracy's parents, losing their daughter. I loved Ron and Cindy almost as much as I loved my folks, and I certainly didn't want to see them hurt. From that respect, this was not going to be easy. I called my parents first and gave them the news. My mom, easily the more emotional of the two, burst into tears immediately. My father, on the extension, started asking for more specifics, so I told him about Tracy being in the car with Derek Biggs at the time of the accident. Who's Derek Biggs? He asked I knew the question was coming, but still I hesitated before answering, which probably told him volumes. An attorney friend of Tracy's, I answered. My father is a very smart man and very perceptive. He didn't miss a beat. So why was she in the car with an attorney friend of hers at a time when she should have been home with you? Because she wasn't with me anymore, Dad. That's why. I caught her and Derek having sex in our bed earlier in the day, and I'm guessing it wasn't their first rodeo together. So I threw some clothes in a bag and left. I don't know why they were in the car at about 6. I'm assuming they were going out to eat, considering the time. Well, shit, son, I'm sorry to hear that. By this point, my mother had composed herself some and gotten back on the line. She heard enough to know what we were talking about. Are you sure she was having sex with another man, Simon? I mean this is not the sort of thing you want to be telling people if you're not sure. I interrupted and was not very diplomatic. Mom, I caught them in the act. I've had sex just a few times in all these years to know what I was looking at. Have you talked to Ron and Cindy yet? Simon, if not, what are you going to tell them? My dad asked. As little as possible, Dad, unless they start giving me the third degree like you're doing. I won't lie, if that's what you're asking. This could get messy, my dad warned. Remember, you're the one who's lost here. Show them the respect they deserve. Yes, sir, I replied solemnly. Calling Tracy's parents felt like deja vu of my own conversation with my folks. Her mother broke down, but her father quickly picked up on the unusual circumstance. Tracy was in the car with another man at the time of her death, a time when she should have been with me. Is there something you're not telling us, Simon? Ron asked, as Cindy cried in the background. It was six on a Friday evening, and Tracy should have been with her husband, not in a car with another man. This equation's not adding up, son. All right. I half yelled, half croaked into the phone. Tracy was running around on me. I caught her in bed hours earlier with the guy she died with, and I gathered some things and I left. I guess they figured at that point they had nothing to hide anymore and were going out somewhere together. You caught them together, in bed. 
in your house. Ron sounded incredulous. He was having a tough time believing the daughter he was just told was dead was also cheating on her husband and died in the car with her lover. Yes, Ron, yes. And right now I'm so mad at her I'm actually happy the two of them died. The witch and her lover got what they deserved. I knew I shouldn't have said that last part to her father, however true it was. He started to yell at me on the phone until I interjected quietly, but forcefully. He was ridiculing me, Ron, while he was screwing your daughter and she was going along with it. She demanded he give her his big tool. Yes, your daughter and my wife. I guess this saves me the trouble of divorcing her. She won't be buried in my family's plots, and I most certainly won't want to be by her side when my time comes. So just tell me the name of the funeral home your family uses and I'll make sure the body is taken there. I'll handle all of that part of it in the financial side. You and Cindy work out the rest, like the viewing. Obviously, I won't be there. You can't just pretend she didn't matter in your life, son, Ron said in his best calming voice. You two were together for almost a decade. You can't tell me all that can be erased. It can and it has. I knew it was over the moment I saw her with Derek Biggs in our bedroom. I stated firmly. Why should her death change how I feel? Maybe someday. With time, you'll feel differently about this and wish you had said a proper goodbye, Ron suggested. Almost in a whisper. I don't think so, I replied quietly. The funeral service took place at Ron and Cindy's home church, the same church where Tracy and I had made our vows. The irony wasn't lost on me. I briefly considered attending, but anger began to well up inside me. Have you ever wanted to throttle a dead person? That's where I was. While attending might have comforted Tracy's parents, it would only have fueled my anger further. And believe me, I had more than enough anger to deal with. About an hour after I figured the service would be over, I got a call from Tracy's sister, Anya. I knew this wasn't going to Pleasant, but I suppose she needed to vent. Especially if her parents hadn't told her the complete story. Tracy was right. You are a piece of shit. You are a small man, with small dreams, and you have a small tool. You write small stories for a small newspaper, and have a small future. I always wondered what took her so long to start cheating on you. Well, pleasant day to you too, Anya, I replied in greeting. So, I'm guessing you knew all along. So then why if I was such a bad guy would you have even wanted me there? Because you embarrassed my parents, you piece of shit. How can you even answer the question as to why Tracy's husband wasn't at the funeral? My parents practically died of embarrassment when they had to tell the reverend why you weren't coming. You were a piece of shit and I hope you die, too. Now you're catching on, Anya. I yelled into the phone. That's exactly what I thought about your sister and her lover after I caught them. And you know what? I got lucky. They did die. So now why don't you just go and leave me alone? I thought that went well. I got a realtor and put the house up for sale immediately. I moved my stuff into the spare bedroom and I sold off for dirt cheap all of our bedroom furniture including the sheets and pillowcases. I was never going to touch any of that stuff again. As for the rest of Tracy's stuff, I took her jewelry, most of which I had given her, and sold it to a local jeweler and gave the money to a church food pantry. Her clothes and everything else I boxed up and took to her parents, telling them they could keep or dispose of the stuff at their leisure. Those boxes included our wedding album and the usual small photos you normally have of each other. I had enough photos of Tracy in my head, with the very last one of her and Derek Biggs in our marital bed that was never going to be able to be forgotten. Ron and I made small talk as he helped me unload by pickup. When the last box had been unloaded, I looked at Ron and Cindy and they looked back at me. We moved in for a tight family hug. I'm pretty sure we were all crying. See you guys. I whispered as my voice failed me. All of this was done in the first two weeks after Tracy's death. Somewhere in the middle of all this, I got a phone call from Kruzmiller Insurance. Tracy and I always had life insurance, so I knew why they were calling. It just wasn't a priority in my life until I got everything squared away. With the obvious tasks out of the way, it was time to return their call. Tracy, being the insurance expert, handled all our insurance purchases. While we discussed everything, I trusted her to make the final decisions in her field. One of those decisions was a $1 million life policy on each of us, with a double indemnity clause for accidental death before age 45. This meant I was due a $2 million payout. But then the insurance agent dropped another bombshell that almost made me choke on my coffee. Since the truck driver caused the accident, his company would likely have to pay for wrongful death, covering both Tracy and Derek. The agent advised me not to settle for less than another $2 million, suggesting $3 to $4 million would be appropriate given the circumstances. After legal fees, I could expect to have about $5 million in the bank. I actually wound up with $4.75 million in the bank after the lawyer took his cut. I really didn't care at that point as I was completely numb. 
The trucking company settled with Derek Biggs' widow as well, and the signing for both was to be at the same time and place. I had never met his widow until the signing, and while I thought Tracy was a beautiful woman, Derek's widow was at least as beautiful, so I wondered why he would risk his marriage for an affair. I guessed that maybe he was so sure of not getting caught he didn't see any risk to the affair. After we had signed the paperwork with the company, Ellie Biggs invited me out for a cup of coffee. Seems she had one question in all of this that never got answered by anybody, and she was hoping that I could provide that information. My husband didn't have a friend named Tracy Tillerson that I was aware of, and after checking, his firm told me she was not a client. Yet they were in the car together when they died. Nobody in Derek's office knows who this woman is, or if they do, they are not telling me. What was your wife to my husband, Mr. Tillerson? I took a big gulp of coffee. Damn, I hated to be the bearer of more bad news to this extremely good-looking woman. I dropped my eyes to the table in the Starbucks we were at. Oh, that bad, she said on cue. Please, Mr. Tillerson, I deserve to know the truth. So I told her the whole story from my side. She looked appalled. I suddenly felt sick to my stomach. Thank you for your honesty, she said as she got up from the table and left the coffee shop. Although I was now wealthy by most people's standards, my life sucked. I had no desire to date. I had moved into a shitty one-bedroom apartment just to have a roof over my head. I had few friends and didn't really care. I worked at the newspaper, rode my bike a lot and lifted weights several times a week. I just existed. My father, bless his soul, finally convinced me to go to a therapist. His diagnosis, trust issues. He encouraged me to get out into the public more and try to have a semblance of a life. That was a waste of an hour. I never made another appointment. So I'm sitting in my place watching baseball and just thinking this time replaying over the conversation with Anya that occurred after Tracy's funeral six months earlier. She said that I wrote small stories for a small newspaper, and she was right. I had taken the job because it was the only newspaper opening near Tracy's job and since she made more money than me, I sacrificed my plans of someday moving to a larger paper until Tracy decided we should move, then I would look again. But now I wasn't tied to the community. In fact, I probably didn't ever have to work another day in my life. I was free to come and go as I pleased and write whatever the hell I wanted and didn't care if anyone ever read it. I went in and gave my boss, Ernie, my two weeks notice. Sitting in my apartment that night, I looked at my library, so to speak. It was a collection of about 30 books, 28 of them non-fiction. One of the two fictions was Moby Tool by Herman Melville. That got me thinking, which some say is dangerous for me. One of my academic strengths in school, according to all the crazy tests you take, was abstract thinking. Before the days of hyperlinks on the internet, I used to do that all the time in my mind. Take a thought, mull it over, twist it around slightly, and go in yet another direction. It worked for me, but it didn't make it easy for my friends to follow my thinking when we would get into deep discussions about things. And they learned never to ask, what if, when I was around. Ten minutes later, it occurred to me that Tracy was always going to be my white whale, and I had to hunt her. But I would do it with the written word. And that's how it started. I sat down at the computer and composed my first fiction story since 8th grade. The Derek Biggs character was killed off, and the Tracy character got severely punished by life. It took me two full days to write it, edit it, and polish it, but for the first time in half a year I felt energized. I still couldn't punish Tracy in real life, but I could in my head in this story. I went on to write 17 more short stories over the next two months, changing things up but keeping a couple of constants. The Derek character always was killed off, and the Tracy character always got her comeuppance. That felt good when I would complete one, set it aside, and then read the finished product. And then I happened back to Mobi Tool. It was an actual book, with a cover and bound pages. I can do that, I thought to myself. Yes, I could, and I did. Six months later I had my first novel, a historical romance, of all things. Of course, the Derek character got killed off, quite viciously I might add, and the Tracy character was again humbled. I thought it was pretty good, and apparently a publisher did, too. The deal I got for my book wasn't amazing, but at least I didn't have to pay to self-publish it. Somehow, it caught the attention of someone else besides me, and the publishing company decided to do two more print runs. They even wanted a second book and offered to double the money, so I went ahead and wrote another one. This time, it was a murder mystery where the character based on Derek was the victim, and the one based on Tracy ended up in jail. Again, completing the book made me feel a lot better about life, especially when it started selling well. It felt like a lot of people agreed with my feelings about Tracy and Derek. Another publishing company approached me after the success of the second book and offered me a three-book deal, also doubling the money. 
since I was already wealthy. I didn't need the extra cash, so I gave the first company the chance to match the deal. They agreed without hesitation. So I stayed with them and gave them three more books over the next 18 months. Each book used the same basic storyline, although I did change the scenarios, and in the third one I even tried some humor. All three were hits, but most importantly to me, I kept feeling better about myself with each book finished. I knew I was never going to be able to get any of my questions about what she did and why she did it answer, so this was as close to any satisfaction I was going to get. Like the old song says, love the one you're with. I signed another three-book deal with my publisher, again with my price doubling, and this time they had some bigger news. Seems that one of the movie studios was looking to make at least two of the books into feature films for some incredibly nice pocket change. They even wanted my help with the screenplay. What the hell, sure, I said. While I had never been a big fan of Oprah Winfrey, her endorsement of a book usually sent the author into the stratosphere of success, and when she chose my sixth book for one of her books of the month, I got to experience that firsthand. It was amazing. And not only was I now a successful author, but I was now being recognized in public. Obviously, there was a downside to that, but I guess that's sort of the price of success. In general, most people are very polite and nice, but every now and then you get a jerk who wants to prove that he or she is not impressed by you. That's okay, because I'm not impressed with me either, but I don't need to take shit from anybody else. I can do rude as well as anybody. So I was sitting in my favorite bar the same one I was in when the state trooper told me Tracy was dead just enjoying a Friday evening with my good buddy Jack Daniels. Now worth north of $10 million, I still enjoyed the simpler things in life. A good drink, working out, riding my road bike, a good-looking woman every now and then. I still lived in the same crappy apartment and really hadn't been searching for lasting female companionship. I think a few of the regulars at the bar knew about my writing success, but for the most part everyone there pretty much left me alone. You know, some playful shit slinging every now and then. But nobody really said anything about reading my stuff. Of course, I was pretty sure that about half of them couldn't read, so that took them off my potential fan club list. Noel, my favorite bartender, knew about my success, and we would occasionally talk about it or something I was working on. But he was a good dude and apparently kept his mouth shut about me. Of course, the fact that I tipped him $20 every time I was in the place probably contributed something to that. I was watching the television screen closest to me, listening to the background music, and in general not paying attention to life when two women were suddenly alongside me at the bar. They were both attractive, I guessed in their mid-30 seconds like I was, and were dressed in jeans and regular tops. They weren't trying to impress anybody, obviously, but there was something about the one farthest from me that seemed familiar. I knew why as soon as she started talking to me. You don't remember me, do you, Mr. Tillerson? She asked as her friend leaned back on her stool so we had a clear line of sight of each other. Truthfully, I didn't at first. Then it clicked. I was looking at Ellie Biggs, Derek Biggs' widow. I had only met her the one time, at the settlement signing when the trucking company paid us for killing our cheating spouses, and at that time I confirmed for her that yes, her shithead husband was cheating on her with my wife. I most certainly do remember you, Mrs. Biggs. It took me a minute, however. How have you been? You certainly look great, if you don't mind me saying so. Ellie blushed and looked at her friend. Then she looked me straight in the eyes. I am much better than the last time you saw me, and honestly, I have you to thank for that, at least from an emotional standpoint. You see, Derek's death left me about two million dollars richer, but I was a total mess when he was killed. And then on top of that I found out he was cheating on me. I was both sad and angry, particularly angry that I would never get to tell that cheating prick what I thought about him. Then one day Rachel here brought me your first book. She had seen your name on the cover and remembered it from my account of our meeting. At first I started skimming it, realizing you were writing about our worthless spouses and you just kept drawing me in. When Derek's character was killed off, I can't describe the feeling of relief I had. Then when Tracy got hers, I felt vindicated, for lack of a better word. That was the best I had felt since that horrible day. I've read every single book you've written. This may sound stupid, but they make me feel better about myself. And I usually giggle like a schoolgirl when Derek and Tracy get theirs. That's kind of how I feel when I finish writing one. I relate it. I'm glad I could help you as well. Considering how well they've sold, I'm guessing there must be a lot of people who can relate to what we've been through. I honestly never considered writing for a career. Hell, I hadn't written fiction since 8th grade. And maybe since I really didn't have to write. Since I had my settlement money. And a lot of insurance money. Maybe that helped things flow out of me. I guess I'll do it as long as it feels good. The three of us shifted over to a table, and I bought a couple of snack trays to munch on. We talked until midnight, when the ladies said they needed to get going. 
I told them I honestly couldn't remember having a nicer night in quite some time, and asked if we could do it again in the future. How about next Friday night? But we start off with a real dinner first. On me, I asked. They both accepted. I met them at my favorite Italian restaurant the next Friday night, and we again had a good time. Both women were attractive in their own right. Ellie had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a curvy figure, while Rachel had long black hair and a more athletic build, with long, toned legs and a shapely rear. Rachel wore a short, form-fitting skirt that accentuated her best features. Honestly, I felt a bit awkward having two of the most attractive women in the restaurant sitting at my table. But deep down, I couldn't deny that I secretly enjoyed their company. We had a great meal and engaging conversation, but with the restaurant filling up, I didn't want to keep others waiting. So, I suggested we continue our evening at a nearby club for an after-dinner drink. Rachel declined the invitation, so I agreed to drive Ellie home after our drink. At Stella's bar, which was only half full, Ellie and I were able to chat comfortably. The first thing I asked her was whether she or Rachel was the winner, and if the winner got me, or if it was the loser. Apparently, she didn't give me enough credit for knowing how the female mind worked, because she blushed a deep red. I was the winner. I hope she stammered quietly. Actually, I think I'm the winner, but I was the winner when you both sat down with me. I think every single guy in the restaurant wanted to beat the crap out of me for hogging the prettiest two women, I said. Ellie blushed deeply again. Can I tell you something? And you promise you won't get mad at me. She looked at me seriously, as she scrunched up her nose. I nodded cautiously, not sure where this was going. I absolutely hated your guts when I left the lawyer's office after we signed the settlement papers. I knew that you had nothing to do with Derek cheating on me with Tracy, but in my mind the fact that you knew, and I didn't put you one up on me, and I didn't take it very well with everything else going down. I kind of felt like you were holding out on me as well. I got that vibe, and I totally understood it. Besides the two of us getting together after our cheating spouses get killed. Oh come on, that's ridiculous. That kind of stuff only happens on the Hallmark Channel. So I let you walk away without even saying goodbye. So a year later Rachel hands me this book, Ellie went on, and it's obvious you were pouring your heart out in the pages, and it was obvious that it was about the affair between our spouses. And it was like someone opened the curtains and let the sunlight in when they got theirs. You completely got it. I have been seeing a shrink for almost a year, and he noticed the change in my attitude right away. So I gave him the book to read, and at my next session he said, and I quote here, pardon my French, but this guy's a genius. Well, if I'm some kind of a genius, then why am I living in a hole in the wall with more than $10 million in the bank? Ellie looked stunned. I knew you had your settlement money, and the big insurance policy, but I didn't realize you were doing that well for yourself. Why are you living like that? Because when you are by yourself and afraid to trust anyone, money doesn't mean a whole I answered. Basically, I'm a simple man with no big vices. I don't have to work, if you want to call my writing work. I don't have anybody to share my life and my money with. Saying it out loud for the first time, I realized just how pathetic I was. I was basically living my life in a fantasy book world where I made Tracy and Derek pay for their cheating ways every six months or so. Yes, it was fun, but in reality, I wasn't really living. I was merely existing. I don't know how long I sat at the table staring at nothing, hearing nothing, feeling nothing until suddenly I felt electricity coming from my lips. Rather the electricity was coming from Ellie's lips which were plastered up against mine, with her tongue soon finding its way into my mouth. I returned her kiss like a man in a desert finding a sip of water. We stayed joined at the lips for probably 30 seconds, and when she pulled away she told me I needed to pay the tab and take her back to my apartment. I did so like a man awakening from a dream. In the four plus years since Tracy died, I have screwed several women, but I hadn't made love to a woman since my wife died. I knew from talking with Ellie that she'd had a few men since Derek, but not a lot either, so I took it real slow and gentle. The kisses were deep and meaningful. We ran our hands over each other's bodies slowly, truly feeling with our fingertips. I mean, Stevie Wonder would have been proud of us. Then when it came time for the main act, we had an amazing and wild sex. I lost all sense of time and space for a second there, and when I regained my senses I was gently laying on top of Ellie, mostly supporting myself with my arms, which were beginning to quiver from the strain. I rolled us gently to our sides so we were facing each other as she slowly opened her eyes while still gasping for breath. Wow, she mouthed at me with no sound coming forth. We lay looking at each other silently, playing a little kissy face like teenagers. Finally, Ellie spoke up. I understand everything you've told me, and all I can say is if you let me in and trust me, I will prove worthy of your trust every day for the rest of our lives. If that's a proposal, I accept, I replied. No, we didn't rush into marriage after one passionate night. 
but that night marked the beginning of our life together. About a year later, once we were both confident that we had worked through our personal issues, we tied the knot. We moved into a spacious new house we had built in the countryside, with five bedrooms, one for us and one for each of the four children we planned to have. We even added a guest suite for frequent visitors. As I embraced my relationship with Ellie, I found that I no longer needed to write revenge stories about Tracy and Derek. Our love and life together were enough to fill my pages with happiness instead of punishment. Despite its continued success and my enjoyment in writing them, I still penned one or two revenge stories each year. This pleased my publisher's accountants greatly. The karma train had been kind to me, so I was happy to welcome a few more passengers aboard for the journey. Second story. Hooked up with a guy who claimed he was single. Recently, I-24 was hooking up with this guy, and his girl caught us in the middle of it. Jordan told me he was single when we first started talking back in November. This is the second time I've been to his house and he told me that he lives with his roommate. I never met his roommate, and he was sneaking me in. That should have been my red flag right there but I didn't mind it. While we were in the middle of it I saw that someone was coming through his bedroom window pulling on his hair. I didn't know what it was at first or why and I saw the woman pull out her flashlight. I ran butt ass naked, heart pounding and racing to the bathroom for getting my clothes in the bedroom. I locked myself in the bathroom for a while because I felt scared. Before she broke open the door, I grabbed a towel. I begged and pleaded with her, telling her that I didn't know Jordan was in a relationship. He always told me he was single and just had a roommate. She tried to hit me while I was naked, so I ran to Jordan's room, struggled to put my clothes on, and then ran out of the house. I felt terrible because she kept hurting Jordan, pulling his hair and hitting him all over the house. I didn't want any part of it, so I walked down the road while calling my friend to come pick me up. She found me at the end of her street and confronted me about what happened. She said mean things about my appearance and threatened me. I know what I did was wrong, but I truly didn't know Jordan was dating someone when he told me he wasn't in a relationship. Now I'm feeling lost and don't know what to do. Third story, getting cheated on has cost me a lifelong STD. Just wanted to vent really because the memories like to come up every so often and it makes me sick all over again. Well my story is a bit depressing to be quite honest. I was on a study abroad trip in the UK and my GF was attending uni in the States. I was away for about 12 months and that was when things started to get thrown off. Like completely. She wasn't as responsive to my texts, calls and started going out a lot more than usual with friends of hers I've never met. I eventually returned and all of a sudden she was way more affectionate than when we first got together. I just assumed she was happy to see me again after one year away. She and I have been intimate before but ever since returning from my trip, I started to break out in my nether regions. The breakouts were really, really bad and awfully painful. I got checked out and well, turns out I had HSV too. I was also put on Valtrix to help with the breakouts. When I found out about the diagnosis, I immediately talked to my girlfriend about it. But I made a mistake by doing it over the phone instead of meeting her face to face. She made me feel like I was the one who cheated on her while I was away. She was crying and shouting at me, and then she said she wanted to break up with me, as if I had betrayed her. We argued back and forth, and I kept asking her to get tested to prove her STD results, but she avoided the question. Eventually, she blocked me on all platforms and told her friends and family that I cheated on her, when it was actually the other way around. I tried reaching out to her family to explain what really happened, but she somehow convinced them to block me and not answer my calls. To this day, I've never heard from her or received any confirmation about her status, but I do know without an absolute doubt that she was the one who cheated and has now given me an incurable STD. Mind you, I do not cheat nor do I believe in cheating. Plus she was my first ever GF of 2.5 years. I was pissed and depressed for a really long time. Still kinda am now to be frank. The only thing I can do is really give myself some sort of peace so I can move FWD. Not only did I feel blindsided but completely betrayed because I have to live with this for the rest of my life. Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.